Welcome back to 7 Seconds or More. This is episode 12. Garrett, welcome back. How was your trip? Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be back. Um, I just got back from Ireland. Well, I've been back for a little bit and it was it was it was it was a blast, you know. I just needed a little bit of a break. And it's good to be back home in the States for sure. Tapping into my Celtic roots myself and watching Celtics ball all at the same time. It's been uh it was it was a great time. I was having You watched the program. Celtics with Sorry, did you watch the Celtics with the Celtics? It wasn't any watch parties, but um, <laughs> no, unfortunately not. It was, but it was a great time, and you know, can't ask for a better result of the Eastern Conference Finals. Uh, that's where I, we were headed last where, last time I was gone, I believe. Yeah, that uh, is uh, that is where we were at the time, but obviously we're a little deeper in now. Oh yeah, oh um, yeah, really exciting time. We are recording this on Tuesday, June seventh, so we are in between games two. And three, the game, the series is tied one one, heading back to Boston at the moment. So it's just a very exciting time at the moment, like I was saying. So a couple of quick things we want to go over before we get into everything else for the day. Uh, get your mailbag submissions in. Uh, as always, that's in the link in the description or wherever else you follow us, whether that's Instagram, YouTube. TikTok, uh, Twitter, you know, really wherever you follow us. Um, and then, yeah, I want to get to providing I can find the photos for some reason that's not cooperating with me at the moment. The simulation of the teams that Duncan, uh, um, Daniel, and I drafted uh, two, two episodes ago. So we took the best players best performances from the conference finals and we made teams out of them. And so, you know, from the Celtics, Heat, Warriors, and Mavericks. And so uh, based off the fan voting, uh, it was basically Duncan and I had the best teams. I I think Dan had a good team, but he went for some meme picks at the end. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Iguodala. Meme picks kind of jeopardized his validity there. Oh, man. (laughs) Yeah. uh, Everything else I thought was good. Yeah. But uh, I will say the simulation in the finals. So I simulated both teams. To we, so Duncan and I were playing each other in the finals. I was the Celtics. He was the Warriors. And uh, Duncan's team won four games to one. Oh, wow. Yeah. And oh. I had my theories. I, I told Duncan before the show that um, it may, I, I thought it went the way I thought it would. Mm-hmm. Um, that's how vague I kept it, but it's because so like my team, I have Draymond on it. Draymond is, I think we talked about this in a previous episode. He's notoriously terrible in two K. Yeah, because there's not a there's not a dog stat, you know. <laughs> <laughs> there's not a technical foul. Uh, I've earned these calls, refs stat. <laughs> there's not a put my foot on the on a guy's shoulders um, stat yeah. or bag. Just record my podcast camera. after game one stat <laughs> <laughs> you know I, I, we're gonna obviously get to this later let's just talk about it now um what did you guys think about the whole Draymond thing because so i because i thought some of it was okay in the sense where i get that you like don't want to toss a guy out of a finals game because i don't know just how it looks but also there was there's this whole thing where it's like I, Van Gundy said in the broadcast that a player like Draymond will get away with more because, like, that's just sort of the way he acts. He he acts in this more demonstrative way, whereas, like, let's say someone like Curry like flared up out of normal, he would get a quicker whistle because that's like more out of his character. And I think that's dumb. Like, re- <laughs> it is. Uh, yeah. I'm right there with no, you. I, I agree with you. I the he got the first tech kind of earlier on in the game, right? And after that, the refs just didn't call anything. And it's just like, I I love that they call less fouls in the finals. It's more fun to watch. Game one was fantastic to watch because of that, because they weren't calling every single thing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when you got the guy, he's doing the offensive guard. Like, he was doing some quick hands, you know, like against the D lineman, pushing. It was three moving screens in a row to get Steph to open three. And that's just not basketball. It's not representative of what's been going on all season. And that should either be a call or a tech when he complains about the call afterwards. And, you know, speaking of football and the mix of sports we got going on with Draymond, you talking offensive guard, he looked like a fullback to me. I'm thinking of the play when he just <laughs> absolutely just bodies Grant Williams and then 
Grant gets the call for a blocking foul. It's like Draymond just ran across the court and just threw his hands into this man. It's like, how? Yeah, well, and make, make at no the same mistake. time, Grant's asking for it. <laughs> oh, like Grant, and the thing, the thing is, Grant wants to be Draymond, right? Like, Draymond's yeah. the kind of player Grant, like, strives to be, except, you know, with shooting, you know? So it's, it's, oh, my goodness. But, you know, you know me, like, I've been singing Draymond's praises all this podcast, you know? He's, he's, he's one of the guys I love to watch. But like, he has—he's been thrown out of finals games before, you know. Like this is this isn't a new thing. He's like, oh, you can't throw him out of a finals game for what? It's like, no, Draymond's done that. Like, like he's been yanked, you know. Like this isn't un, this isn't like unprecedented territory for him, you know. Like, do it again, you know. Especially if he's doing like blatantly illegal plays all the time. And it's, you know, it's it's inter- definitely interesting to watch as a Celtics fan that enjoys watching Draymond as well, you know, cause like you, the shenanigans you live and die by. Right. But at the same time, this, the refing was so questionable all game. And we we're looking at like other things like Derek white jumping over Jordan pool, breaking up. A yeah, path. Like I, it's like, it's, it's just like some things that are just like, what I was confused on, on that here? one at first yeah. and on the replay, I understand Derek did step over him. And mm-hmm. here's the thing. I think if Jordan Poole didn't hit Derek White when he stepped over him, it would have been a tech on Derek. Because, you know, he he jumped over him. There there is like, like no he's other route back, back in defense. The yeah. There were so many other routes back in. He could have gone like turned around and gone the other way, but no, he jumped over Jordan Poole. And I think what Jordan Poole did was bad. But at the same time, if Jordan Poole had done nothing, it would have been a tech on Derek White. I don't know. I don't um, think so. It's not like it's Allen Iverson, bro. Like it's it's not like a disrespectful step over. You know, it's. Just, I think it's it's in the rule. I'd be interested to see what the rule book is because true. I, I feel like somewhere yeah. in there, there's just like a, even if it wasn't like a super disrespectful play, it's like stepping over or jumping over the player after something like that. Generally, I feel like that's always an automatic tech. I don't think they'd call it. I think. Uh, first of all, I think White is um, generally a very clean player. Um, mm-hmm. He's been mic'd up with the refs, too, and he's seemed very respectful. And I, I just think that's the immediate reaction. I don't know. He got a block. He, like, fell to the ground. He's trying to get back, and he trying just – The quickest yeah. way was through, I, I suppose. And especially on a fast break, right? Like, that's that's the context, you know? It's like you got to be moving. You got to be hustling back. You know, you just got your play broken up. You got to want to go make sure you don't make any more mistakes, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think Jordan Poole, uh, if he had a little more, any more effort or any more like obvious intent on that, it would have been an easy tech on him. But since it was like around his face, you know, minimal contact, even though it was contact, I, I like that they kind of just played on. However, you know, if Draymond was on the ground there and if he jumped over Draymond, Draymond's fucking, excuse my language, <laughs> Draymond's throwing him to the ground and all that. <laughs> And that kind of, like, one thing I wanted to ask you, Peter, what do you think these, like, non-techs and everything, how do they set up game three for the refing and the players? Well, it's a couple things. Now, these teams don't have a lot of history, uh, so there's not going to be that that sort of checkered history where a guy is coming at a guy because he's been disrespectful in the past. There seems to be a lot of mutual respect between these teams, so I don't think there's, there's any of that. A lot of it's also predicated off of uh, refereeing. Now, in this past game, I thought the fouls, I think you could make that excuse in the first half because uh, it really took the flow of the game. I mean, in the first like six minutes, there was a real flow to the game. It was very exciting to watch, very similar to game one. And then it was really a combination of things. Now, I'm not going to come out here and say that if you look at like the foul shots, you can be like, oh, well, the refs were giving him more. No, the Celtics were making some really dumb fouls, some really dumb take fouls in transition while they were already in the bonus. They like were... When Tatum tried to intercept that pass, like that was stupid. Yep. He just wound up mm-hmm. parking Steph Curry, like obvious foul in the bonus. Some stuff deep in the shot clock where they were, you kind of bailed them out of the possession by giving them free throws. So I think it's kind of a dumb... Ex- Ryan Rosillo was talking about this on a podcast earlier this week how it's easy to look at the box score and see free throw disparity and be like, oh, well, the refs were, this guy was getting more foul calls. But at the same time, who the referees are are a big deal. Game two was a Zach Zarba-led crew, um, and also, uh, I, I can't think of his name at the moment. Tony Bradley was also there, I'm pretty sure, right? Huh? 
Wasn't Tony Brothers also in the Zack yeah, Zarba? Yeah, yeah, that's who I was. I couldn't think of his name. That's weird, yeah. Tony, yeah, it was a Tony Brothers staff. Zack Zarba is the crew chief, so in theory, it's not a Tony Brothers staff. But Celtics don't have a great history with Tony Brothers. And in Game Three, no. it'll be Scott Foster. Now the Celtics have had a mixed history with Scott Foster. He's known as being the extender, and because this game's in Boston, does that mean Golden State will get a favorable whistle? I don't know. I don't really want to read into that too much. I think mm-hmm. the players mm-hmm. know how a game's going to be whistled based off a of ref and based off the momentum of a series. And as much as some people may talk about how certain refs will massage or that, that's the word Bill Burr was using this week, um, <laughs> or sort of uh, call a game a certain way, you got to know how, how they're going to call it and anticipate it and, and play your game around it and find a way to win. I mean, every game... In a regular season, there's pretty much a different ref crew. They call and see a game differently, and based off the opponent you're playing that night and the personnel you have available, you're going to play differently. Like, there's so many factors. I think it's kind of dumb all the time to be like, oh, well, the refs took us out. Yes, like, individual plays, sure. You can you can look at one play and be like, all right, you missed it. But, like, 95% of the time, the refs are probably right. That's a passing grade. They're professionals, yeah. And, like, I think... But, but, you know, every time I hear, like, the ref excuse, right? And, like, I've heard it a lot this season from my fellow Celtics fans up in here in Mass. You know, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> it's, I think, the one thing that does get me, though, is in no other sport do we know, like, names of specific referees and their, like, their tendencies, how they call games. Like, that's just not a thing. And And, like, you don't hear about, like, a specific football guy that's, like, Oh, you know, he's notorious for a bad spot or something. Like, there's no one in any other major league sport that impacts a ref, pardon me, impacts the game in the same way as NBA refs. Like, the fact that we Maybe know baseball. guys. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually going to like I'm Angel gonna, I'm walk you back a, a little bit. You but were like, right that one individual ref, it, basketball is the one where you can make the most impact as a single that's what I'm referee. Saying, yeah. But there are. Angel Hernandez is notoriously the worst baseball umpire mm-hmm. by a country mile. Oh, wow. And there's also Joe West before him. And in in NF, in the NFL, I didn't know them by their bad calls, but there was like who's that guy? The guy who who had the really like tight sleeves. <laughs> who would who would uh, I think his dad was a ref too. <laughs> I don't I know. I don't know who you're talking about. Yeah. But yeah, you you are right, Garrett, definitely in saying that. The NBA is is where an individual ref can can make the and, most impact on a game. And if I can go further, I think it's more of like because you know Angel Hernandez, he's just all around awful. He'll call a ball that's like a foot out of the strike zone, a strike, you know, or like it's just sporadic and random. He's just bad at his job, you know. But like <laughs> Scott Foster being known colloquially as the extender, like Zach Zarba always like putting in like this theatrics to it, it, it seems like there's a lot more intent you know i don't I, I, this is me putting on my tinfoil hat you know it seems like it's like there's being bad at your job a la angel hernandez right and then there's like having your own nickname as someone that impacts a series by putting it to longer games because you're intentionally like calling these fouls and having that greater impact on the game because you're an nba basketball rep you know what i mean it's like the fact that we know first and last names of guys, right? Say what you will about baseball. If we're NBA refs and know what like they tend to do as like how they always impact the game is like, that's yeah. a uniquely basketball problem. I think how much longer until the robots take over? Cause I know one I know. thing I've been watching some of the tennis grand slams and they don't do it in the French open. Cause there's a clay court and you know, the ump will get down and see if there's like a ball mark on the line or not, but in the Australian open and in the U S open, they have like a simulated thing. They have like cameras and computers everywhere. And after a debated call, the player can like go to the ref and be like, I want that one reviewed, you know, no, no challenge necessary. And they look at it and they pull up the computer and they're either right or they're wrong. You know, maybe tennis is more like a right or wrong sport where it's in, it's in or it's out. But like, how is that not the case for basketball? And then I guess it kind of is the case because that uh, Max Struess three, they walked it back. But I, I think for like fouls, the refs should really, there should be someone like overriding some of them. Like the, the Jalen Brown one against, was that against Draymond? I forget. Um, where he like 
barely, barely bumps into him and gets the foul. And like it was obviously not a foul. Uh, just some some of those things. Maybe maybe there should be like clearer rules for like what a foul is, or they should just call fewer fouls. <laughs> I don't know, but it, it's it's kind of obnoxious when uh, like a ref can dictate how the flow of the game is played. Yeah, yeah. They would do well. They are like amazing referees. Like to be able to look at all of these different facets of the game and still get most of these things. Like like you're saying, Pete. Like like ninety five percent of these calls right and still make it. But we could get ninety nine point nine percent right with <laughs> the computer. True. <laughs> like, true. come on. <laughs> it's still it's still really impressive, you know. And then there's yeah. other things you got to for a computer to quantify. Like, do you ever call defensive three seconds or like carries or you know tr- like it's. So much of like the change the rules. <laughs> there you go. There you go. But Pete, it seemed like you wanted to say something. Yeah, I just don't think there's a perfect solution to any of this. Um, I know uh, minor league baseball's tested robot umps. That is the one sport where it probably makes the most sense because a strike zone is the most tangible thing that there can be a right and wrong. At the same time, if if an ump is calling a wider strike zone or or a narrower or a taller, shorter, whatever it may be. You adjust throughout the course of a game, and of course, if there's inconsistencies, you know, like I, you called this a strike for them. Why don't I get this call? Like something like that. Like that's frustrating. But I think it's part of the sport. Part of the sport is also like three second calls in the playoffs. They don't really happen. Carries you call a carry every possession if we're if we're doing the carry thing. I, I think there's the the yeah. There's no perfect way to do it. There's no perfect way to do the rules. Um. And and to end this sort of ref thing, uh, this is not we're not saying anything against referees. I think these are just frustrations that the average fan has, and that you can notice by watching multiple games, and you're wondering why a game gets called this way, and then the next game it's different. It's because of different referee crews, and sort of the different point of the series is at, and the game is at, and so there's just a lot of factors at hand, and it's really interesting to observe and sort of take note about. Yeah, one thing I will say, um, sorry, I know you wanted to end it, but I found an interesting article. Um, for the NBA refs, I like that they're full-time paid employees. Because in college basketball, all those refs are part-time. You know the reason why there's the possession arrow in college really? basketball? Yeah. They're part-time? No kidding? They're like dentists and lawyers. And, well, maybe Ironman. not. But like they're, they're Ironman part-time. plumbers? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but the there's the possession arrow in college basketball. And in the rule books, it's because... The college basketball refs aren't well equipped enough to accurately do jump balls because they're not trained to do it. That's why there's a possession arrow in college basketball. Really? That's yeah. ridiculous. Pat McAfee had Gene Ster- Sterator on his show and they were talking oh, yeah. about that. And I was like, oh my goodness, that is so stupid. But a uh, little quick trivia for you guys. What do you think entry level ref uh, salary is? And what do you think the upper level, like, most experienced senior referee salary is. Is this for you know, a year? Is this for NBA for or year. college? NBA. Okay, I'm going to go 15000 for the part-time or whatever, and then the, sorry, no, 20000 on, and then the upper end, I'm going to go like one hundred fifty k. Okay, well, I'll, I'll clarify on this. So this is just NBA um, entry-level referees and senior referees for the NBA season. I'm, I'm probably go. really, I'm probably way undershooting it. I'm going to go upper level, like, 90K. And then, like, entry level, like, something like, call it, like, 45. I wanted to say 50, but I'm like, uh, that's people. Okay. we have a lot more people going into refereeing if that's the case. <laughs> so according to Career Trend, mm-hmm. entry level NBA referees, referred to as rookies, earn 250 stacks per year. And the senior ones earn up to 500K per year. And then they get a bonus for each playoff game. That makes way more sense. Yeah, I really That's undershot bonkers. it. Yeah. That's and bonkers. Something... Really, I really, really undershot it. Yeah, and then something oh that's kind God. of surprising, um, according to this article, uh, is that the WNBA refs earn around 180 k per year, which is probably well above the average player salary in the WNBA. No, it which definitely is. Which is just so that's messed insanity. up. That's insanity. The WNBA is getting better and better. But I've watched some a lot of those games this season. The refs suck in the WNBA. Part of the reason that the flow is so bad is just because they're not as good as the NBA refs. Because they make yeah. less. 
Man, I guess I'm in the wrong industry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we should all start going to referee school. Uh, and yeah. we'll see how high up we get. So getting back to what actually happens on the court, um, <laughs> I do have some some really interesting thoughts. I want to get to more of a we can I mean we can quote talk about X's and O's and and stuff like that. I think Golden State absolutely abusing the pick and roll is something that Boston needs to take note of because yeah. I think it's they either need to get the ball out of Curry's hands quicker or and let other guys beat them. But again, it's it's a question of how much are you going to give Curry before you you try to stop him? I think he, game one that much. You could go to no game one. He was still lighting the seas up like with any kind of daylight at all. Like as soon as right, he popped game up one the screen, quarters two through four. <laughs> okay, because <laughs> they made an adjustment there, and it was like not too much like double teaming, triple teaming, but just enough that made them a little more contested. Um, a little more off-ball guarding, and kind of took away the three from Curry a bit. What's been giving them a lot of the open looks, though, is how they've been coming out of these, starting these games, you know? is like, they play, if we're talking X's and O's, they're playing Curry in, like, a lot of drop, you know? A lot of drop coverage. People, like, guys like Tice, guys, like, just people that are, like, feeling like there's going to be a Curry drive when, if Curry gets, like, more than, like, a bread box of daylight, he's shooting to three, you know? It's... Steph freaking yeah. Curry, you know? Like, yeah, I think one thing they need to do is commit to switching because I've noticed a lot, like, you know, the guy, guys like Tice, they don't, he doesn't want to switch on to Curry, but uh, they also have to try to stop blocking the three and just contest the three because the second you jump and try to block the three, you know, Curry just goes around and gets an easy lay. So there's some in between that they have to do with switching on those screens and not giving them broad daylight afterwards. What would you do if you're an uh, email? What are you saying on these off days, Peter? What am I saying? Uh, we need to stay home and play our brand of basketball. Uh, I think all the time they were, Emi said himself that they were sort of hunting for fouls and then playing sort of outside of themselves. And I think they need to get back to their brand of basketball. Also, one thing, I don't know if they were doing this because they were trying to get going or they they just liked the matchups, but there was a lot of hunting individual matchups and going one on one. And part of my issue of that of that is not like the individual matchups. If you have Jordan Poole, you're gonna go you're gonna hunt him. But it was a lot of the like sort of settling. What happened, uh, Jalen Brown would take like a deep contested three over Curry. Sometimes he would make it. But the issue is you're not making them work. You're not putting any pressure on them on defense. If I'm the Boston Celtics, I want to put pressure on them defensively, make them work on the defensive end to take some of the wind out of their sails. I, I feel like I sound like Mark Jackson. He sort of talks like this. He's always like, if I'm the Boston Celtics, I want to put pressure on them. I want to make those guys work. But it's true. It, as, as, with as much movement, as Golden State has on offense and how much they can get going and everyone's just rolling it downhill and moving like that. I want to make those guys work. Like, yeah, I, yeah, my, my strength if on the Celtics is based off strength and physicality. So let yeah. me like lean into that and, and have that strength take away one of the strengths for Golden State. And yeah, I agree with what you're saying. Um, one thing the Celtics have to come back to is forcing the Warriors to commit more turnovers. And on the other side of the court, in, in game two, uh, they had so in game one, the Celtics outscored the Warriors thirty four to twenty six in the paint, and in game two, the Warriors outscored them forty to twenty four. When the Warriors are taking away the paint, then all of a sudden those threes that they're just taking, even even though they're making them, it, it's just not worth as much. Um, I agree. They're kind of like it's one aspect of the, of Boston's basketball that's gone. And interestingly enough, they've been shooting pretty similarly from three both teams uh, in game one. The Celtics shot 21 of 41, 51%, and the Warriors 19 of 45, 42%, which isn't too far off. And in game two, they were tied from three, exactly, 15 of 37 on both sides. So the three ball, there's no issue with that, but you're going to make your three more effective when you have more of a presence in the paint and you can threaten them on both sides. I completely agree. And like we talk, Peter, you're talking about how this we want to get back to our brand of basketball, right? Like that's I remember I was at the so I was at the Boston Faneuil Hall watch party for game one before 
on, on like last Thursday. It was great. But when we were going down in the first and second quarters, right? Even like that game was saved by a traffic fourth quarter, but all through the game, it seems like what got us back into like striking distance that game to have a traffic fourth quarter was playing our brand of basketball. And at times it was, it was slipping. Like there was no points in the paint. It seemed like we came into San Francisco and wanted to play golden States game. It seems like we're taking so many more threes than I feel like this team is used to this in this entire playoffs, you know, like we've had hot, hot cold shooting here and there, but like, we haven't had as much access to the paint as there, like there's, there's no huge paint protector at Golden State, a la like Giannis, Alabama to bio versus you know Bucks and Heat. Like I feel like they've gotten used to trying to avoid the paint versus those matchups. Whereas we, like you said, Peter, we have that size and physical advantage, and they should just use it and go back to the what the like drive and kick, like attack the paint mentality that they've had that's made them successful the second half of the season. It just yeah. seems like Peter, do you think the, Yeah, I agree with what you're saying, Gary, but Peter, do you think the um the kind of perimeter protectors of Gary Payton um coming back changes uh some of the ability to infiltrate the paint? hundred percent. I thought Gary Payton was one of the most impactful players for Golden State and unlocked a lot of things for them in a lot of ways. Without Ugudal available, they were able to get rid of some of those minutes. It meant some less Jordan Poole minutes. Obviously he came in and sort of blow out time and started to pour it in. But what Gary Payton was doing is at first he was on Tatum. And at first I was kind of confused because there's a big size advantage, but what he was doing is he was sticking on Tatum like glue, making him work to bring the ball up the ball up the court That made them uncomfortable. And they played with like a sort of false sense of urgency. They're kind of reckless at times, the Celtics. And it took them, or it made them take longer to get into their offensive sets. And it, they ended up getting worse shots at the end. Uh, but what you were talking about earlier in terms of getting into the paint and how they need to get more into that, the Celtics were abysmal in their two-point shooting percentage. They were in the 20s or 30s shooting from two, which you would think you would have a higher percentage than that because the way basketball is played nowadays, it's not a lot of mid-range, so your twos would be a lot of layups. So you'd think you'd have a higher percentage. Obviously in the playoffs, uh, how you need to create your own shot, there'll be more mid-range, you'll probably be a lower percentage. But they were they're trying to play to the refs. They were at Tatum a lot of the times would lose the ball and he throws his hands up and he's wondering where the call is and sort of throwing up some wild shots at the end of a shot clock with, with multiple contests there. Mm-hmm. They need to figure out A, how to finish, or B, how to get people out of the paint or find the open guys on the outside. That may mean like more threes for Derek White. And if he's not hitting, then that kind of stings. But if they're good looks, that's what you can get. Uh, Second Spectrum has a stat where it's, it, 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 it's, about, it's called shot quality, where it, it rates how open and like how good of a shot it is, regardless on if it goes in. And in the first half of game three, the Celtics, it was like around 44, which was their lowest in the playoffs. And the for the Warriors, it was like 54, 56. Now, I don't really know like what the number like intrinsically means, but that 56 or whatever it was for the Warriors was like their third highest of the playoffs. So mm-hmm. the Warriors were just getting better looks. So I think the Celtics need to get better looks and whether that is... Um, I don't know, having someone else bring the ball up the floor, trying to make a pass later when you're in the paint to draw more attention to get these outside shooters more open. Um, but whatever it is, you need to get better looks. Yeah, I think one thing that's been working for the Celtics throughout the playoffs is that quick transition. Um, that's why I love seeing Al, Big Al, on the on the the floor because he'll get that rebound and it's like less than a second. It's like like Brady release time, you know. Uh, it's in his hand and it's down the court, you know, and it really puts the pressure on the defense instead of the pressure on the offense on each play. And I think that's something easy that would help them instead of like Tatum sometimes like trying to scan what's going on while he's walking and gets across like half court right at 17 or 16 seconds. Um, I think that's more of a benefit to the Warriors than the Celtics. Um, additionally, something I'm interested in to see or when, when, the game goes to back to Boston. 
uh, I was looking up some of Chef Curry's three-point percentages. And in the regular season, his three-point percentage was better at, like on the road, which I thought was interesting. Because watching game one and game two, it felt like every three he took was going to go in. Just the, the tension in the crowd. They saw him take one up, and I think that really helps him. He's shooting 40% from three at home throughout the playoffs, but only 36 on the road. So I think that's something that they can capitalize on because when, um, when Curry gets some of, his, some of those deep threes down, it gives the Warriors some momentum. So we'll see at game three if the Celtics are able to capitalize on maybe some more missed threes and more transition offense and hopefully more, some more fast break points for the Seas. And speaking of transition and talking big Al, you know, the other things I really love about Al and what he can do in transition is just take the ball himself and hustle up the court and then make his own Al Horford 36 year old fast break by his lonesome. <laughs> He's got that old man strength to make it happen. And I think stuff like that and is another key to this coming home to Boston for the series for the Celtics is having that kind of, you know, damn it, we'll do it ourselves kind of mentality of like, we got to focus and make it happen. And, play hard you know al brings a physicality he brings a, a dedication and he, even his body language tells you that he's like here and he wants to play more you know like we saw it in the buck series we saw it in the heat series and i think we need to see it from everybody in this, this celtics team in this series if they want to make any kind of waves in this finals and because i think so much of what really took the wind out of our sails in this game too is body language like 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 peter you were saying like they're all hunting for fouls and they're not making they're not they don't have that Boston South like defensive physical play hard identity you know and if you look at the tail of two games at the half both teams both games led only by two right like they're by all accounts a closed game but there's something that just compel, felt completely different this game too with the Celtics physicality and intensity and it seemed like once they didn't get the calls like Jason Tatum you know throwing his arms up like man like what's going on that's it's yeah. not something you want to see out of your team leader, you know, like, especially as a teammate, you're not going to play as hard. And it's felt like that game was so much further out of reach game two than game one, where it's like, okay, no, yeah, we're, we're still in it. It's two points at the half, you know, we can make it happen. Yeah. Another thing with team leader, Jason Tatum, that I'd be interested in seeing is more dunks because, you know, he's very good at that contested layup, but it's just not been going down for him. You know, he hasn't been making the impossible possible. So I think just, you know, he's athletic enough to go over those players and dunk it, putting in that extra effort to have a higher percentage shot would help get some momentum. And then maybe you get your, your crazy layup in afterwards. But speaking of Big Al, where was he in game two? He was one for four from two and didn't attempt any threes after going six of eight from three, which is very confusing to me. I don't know if that's the Warriors, what you guys can, um, uh, like give me your feedback whether the Warriors just defended him very well which is possible or if it just wasn't in the game plan for Big Al to shoot threes it's a couple things if you look at the the stats for game one every single shot attempt that Al Horford had was registered as uncontested mm-hmm. or, or wide open rather and Al's been very streaky in the course of the regular season not in terms of shot making but in his attempts, sometimes he's he's open for three and he's not feeling it that night and he will defer. Other times, like what we saw in game one, he's very quick trigger. I think it might depend on the scouting report or the way that the game was going because obviously a lot of his damage in game one came in the second half. And I think Golden State did a good job rotating and realizing that he will take those shots. And so if you get a body near him, he will hesitate and he will probably look to defer so yeah i don't the solution i was like he's a good player he was like number three pick or number four pick in his draft like two spots behind kevin durant he he's gotten a couple post looks but he he just doesn't have like that post bag he has like the old man ymca game to a degree where he just <laughs> kind of backs him down and just sort of <laughs> just tries to get it off the backboard but I don't. I don't know what the solution is. It might be some some pick and fade game with Tatum going big, like big, um, getting the ball in his hands more, going downhill off dribble handoffs. You saw what Draymond's done a couple times. It's a real patented Draymond move where it's a fake dribble handoff and then he speeds around 
the uh, basically the corner into a layup. So, and I think yeah. Al feeds off the home crowd. He'll probably come out with a certain fire. Uh, but one thing I just wanted to say before uh, we had to break is I think that these two games will be a benefit to Boston because between games three and four, there's only one day off. It goes Wednesday and Friday. And so regardless of who wins game three, Boston will be going back to their homes and then they'll be going back to either the practice facility or their own home locker rooms where Golden State will be in a different environment. So it's I'm gonna I'm gonna fine, I'll make this prediction. Regardless of who wins game three, All right. I think Boston's winning game four. I just it, it feels like that's sort of the way it goes, especially mm-hmm. in the early parts of the series where you have two games in a row in in a home site. So, yeah, I'm going to go. Boston will win game four, regardless of when, who wins game three. Yeah. Any thoughts on well, that? I, well, I think they'll, they'll have to, you know, <laughs> if, they want, if they want to contend at all in this finals. You know, it's like down two, two, one at home. We've seen the Celtics when their back's against the wall. They know the season's on the line. They, they got to make, when they got to perform, they perform. They make it happen. So I'm right there yeah. with you. Like the, the bounce back Celtics are. We're talking how these seeds have been a tale of two teams all season long. Bounce back Celtics are that team. Like they're yeah. making it happen. I and- think also, yeah, Ime's trying to break the record of most game seven victories as a rookie coach. Uh, right now, he's tied for the record at two. So uh, you, you know they're going for that game seven. I think it's very very possible they split here as well. And then it's two two. Wait, right now, brand new series going back to Boston. I'm with you, Pete. And you know I think. This is like the first time I felt like all postseason long after a loss that I don't know if we're going to get this one, you know, because it seems like pretty automatic. The Celtics are like, what, 6-0 and no after a loss this, this postseason or something like that? Like, they haven't lost two games in a row all postseason. It's kind of bonkers. But, like, the way we just got absolutely shellacked, even after the Heat series, I felt like, oh, yeah, we can still win these games. Like, this one, this one's got me... A little trepidation right now. I don't know. I think I hope we don't split. I hope we obviously win too as a diehard green teamer. But like, I don't know, man. Doubt seep yeah. for me. We got to credit the Warriors defense. You know, they they were second or maybe not second. They were top five during the regular season. Um, they've really done a, a great job adjusting. Steve Kerr is a fantastic coach. So I am excited for these next two games in Boston to see what uh, Steve throws at Ime. And what Ime throws back. I, I also have to give Golden State their credit because I had uh, we had made a TikTok or Instagram reel, which is available in the link in the description, uh, about <laughs> the our series predictions. I made one for Dan and I. I didn't make one for you, Duncan, because we had the same prediction. All good. But a lot of it was me banking on the Celtics defense. And then there's a guy in the comments who's like, like, bro is acting like the Warriors don't have the second best defense. I know it's true. It's a very good point. I give credit where credit's due. They, they really only have like one guy that you can really like attack with certainty, and that's Jordan Poole. Because Curry yeah. has bulked up. He's gotten a lot stronger. He's very solid. They're a very smart team. They have a good scheme. They went to the zone a couple times. They have some long defenders in Draymond and Wiggins. Looney is a rock down in the post. So uh, coming on the road, I think that'll be very interesting to see how they adjust both teams. And so we'll get into a little more of that after the break. (laughs) Coming back from the break, uh, (laughs) we're going to talk about sort of something I've noticed is how reactionary sort of the media, um, just anyone who who really talks about this series has been. And this goes really throughout the whole playoffs and how Mm flip-floppy we can be and and how we react. Uh, Certainly before the series, I think there was a, a... a lot of people picked Golden State in probably six or seven games. And if you went with the Celtics, it would have been like a sexy pick. It would have been going against the grain. And then after game one, after the way Boston really came out of nowhere and, and stunned Golden State, there was a lot of people being like, oh, well, I don't know, you know, what, how Golden State's going to respond. You know, how, how, they're, how many games are even going to win in this series? It seems like Boston oh is the God. clear, better team. Yeah. You know, it's crazy. At the watch party on Thursday, everybody – Everybody was saying a chance to go on the T like Celtics and four. It's like, oh guys, my God. please, 
please. Yeah. I saw like an ESPN graphic that was like Celtics have an eighty four percent chance of winning. Yeah, and I was like, they're they're up one zero. Yeah. Like, <laughs> oh, good BPI. Yeah, it's a seven game series. After and then I mean after this past game, there's been a lot of uh, well, well probably Golden State's a better team. Like we saw what they can do. What does Boston really have an answer? But at the same time, if you if you zoomed out, if if you were told that after game two the series would be tied one one, you would think Boston did their job and that you know they're in a decent spot coming back home for two games in Boston. And if you were told that they won game one in Golden State, you probably would have been like, "Whoa, that's wow! I would have never expected that." But mm-hmm. at the at this, so basically, what I'm saying is it's kind of like the way we talk about it, reacting after every single game is kind of a lot. Like you we get a little too reactionary to this but th- there's still some truth to it i mean if you look at if you look at the game itself if you're watching the game and following it there's a lot you can see after game 1 your question is well golden state needs some help outside of curry what has happened to clay draymond just is playing with no energy pool is a complete non entity after game 2 you're saying brown and tatum really have no help what happened to horford they need to stop Curry. Uh, what happened to Clay? <laughs> That's still true. <laughs> um, and then you know Draymond came out with a passion. They let Pool get get going. So it's just crazy how much we we sort of flip flop. Where yeah, even even you might be. Guess what? If Golden State wins in seven, or Boston wins in seven or six, or whatever it is, and you said in the beginning of the series, you you could easily be right. But you know, after one game, you're not going to say Boston in four. You're not going to say yeah, Golden one, State one in, things, in seven because of yeah. one game. And one of the things that I was taking a little solace in last night after catching most of the game and driving home from Connecticut, or two nights ago, I think it was now, but like I heard on I heard on the radio that's like, you know what, it's like only one game. Like you can beat us by 50, but like it's still one game. And like you said, Peter, like if the Seas are coming back to Boston – with home court advantage and like for the rest for like the series so far, splitting one one a brand new series like on a macroscopic scale, you're exactly right. Like that's this they're in good position, you know. It's what they want, but yeah, it's 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 crazy how like I mean you saw this kind of discourse in the Heat series too, you know. Like after every blowout between the Celtics and the Heat, it's like oh the Heat are gonna run away with it. oh the Celtics are gonna run away with it, you know. It's it was it's just crazy man but yeah yeah I, I, I think one thing for the rest of the series i'd be interested in seeing is playing more third quarter basketball because <laughs> yeah. that's kind of where it's fallen apart for <laughs> most teams and kind of resting your players and preparing them for the third quarter like in the first two quarters it's been pretty close like stay within 10 points put Peyton Pritchard in a little earlier give him some more important minutes in the first half that way Uh, Because he can hold his own and, you know, give some rest to maybe Marcus and Derek White uh, and then as well as Jason and Jalen. And then come full steam ahead third quarter and try to build that lead because that's how these games have been won. Same for the Warriors, you know, uh, giving some more time off to Curry. You know, he can shoot the lights out in the first quarter and they still lost that game. Uh, Focusing more on resting your players and winning the second half versus the first half. Yeah, you, you do see some of it too, because in the first quarter, a lot of um, it seems that these guys follow their sort of regular rotation. And, you know, around the six minute mark, Tatum comes out. Um, you saw in game one, you know, like a little after the first quarter, and Curry comes out, even though he was he was on fire. And then the second half, it seems it's a lot more reactionary on the fly. Uh, part of that is catered based off foul trouble and, and, Oh, if they're bringing Curry in, then I need to bring White in or something like that. Uh, yeah. One thing I had this is sort of an aside. How long will it take for me to start calling uh, Derek White not by the full name? Because <laughs> I'll say Jalen, I'll say Jason, or I'll say Tatum. We'll say Smart. We'll say Marcus. We'll say Al, Rob, Grant. I don't know. I don't well, say you're not Derek. On first ter- first name terms with Derek. <laughs> or last. Yeah, I'm not. No, I say I say Derek White. Maybe maybe just like the name. It's a very clean name. He yeah. needs a nickname. Well, uh, I've heard D White, not not really a nickname. And you know, I heard from um, Spurs Twitter that they call him the Buffalo back in San Francisco. There it is. Oh my the gosh, Buffalo. I'm taking that. 
buffalo. Well, one thing that's that's <laughs> fun with the buffalo. buffalo. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, he's really turned it around after fathering his child. Like that's where it started. His three point percentage before the baby was twenty four percent in the playoffs, and after is like forty three or something like that. It's like that Van Vliet leap when we saw Fred get uh, have and a kid. Full, exactly. Went full yeah. Fred. Full Fred. Yeah. So, uh, maybe there's a there's a nickname to do with that with his child. <laughs> maybe maybe he can be the stork. Yeah, but Derek, <laughs> there you go. The stork. Um. Yeah, I mean, sorry, we're riding, we're riding the high of Brother Bear, trying to find a better one after oh, that. True. Yeah, Desmond Bain, come on the show. <laughs> Anytime. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, I, certainly, I like you saw in the end of like the first quarter and the third, they uh, the Celtics put uh, like two minutes to Daniel Tice to see if they could get away with it, and in the first yeah, quarter they, they pretty not. much they were pretty much okay, but third mm-hmm. quarter they've. Tice just playing drop on a, on a high high pick and roll. Curry just shooting yeah, that, over the top, that, making that it. That play gives me nightmares, man. It's just like Tice, dude. What are we doing, man? Hey, it's hey, the Curry. Yeah. <laughs> the best thing about that game that Mike Breen was not doing it because if you heard him doing those bangs, oh and then some of the Jalen Brown, you heard like a way off. Like that's <laughs> still more. Way like, off. Oh yeah. Hey, he's back for game three. Hopefully, it'll be some puts it in. Uh, on both sides. Dylan Brown from deep. That's crazy. Yeah. Dang. You know, we were talking briefly about Brother Bear, and it's got me thinking about this Warriors Grizzly series that we watched a while ago. There was a Grizzly blowout in that one too, and the Warriors still clutched it out. You know. So I'm thinking, like, and and you know, the Grizzly. I don't. This I may be grasping at strongest here, but they're like a stronger, more physical team that that did give like this the the Warriors some fits. You know, and. Yes. I don't know. I feel like we have to maybe not follow in their footsteps as if you're the Celtics, you know, but like definitely we're, like we were talking about earlier, give them the physicality that gave them so much of a trouble. Well, there's a blow in that series too. Granted, Grizzlies won it, but I don't know. I think this is, this is a weak connection, but if I think there's still chance, still definitely a chance for the Celtics this year. Like yeah. it, we're talking about reactionary stuff where it's like, oh, it's Warriors series now, you know? I don't know. This yeah, is my, this I, is if my I'm the green Warriors, tilted glasses. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm the Warriors, I'm continuing what, what they're doing. There's some some of those clips of like Curry being quadruple teamed because mm. Grant Williams wants to save the team. So every time that Curry has the ball, he leaves his assignment to try to block it, which leaves whoever he's guarding in the post wide open. Mm. So if I'm them, I, you know, you don't target Grant. But you try to get Grant to double team because he he does it a lot. Um, so to continue doing those pick and rolls and putting pressure in the post. And if I'm the Celtics, you know, you kind of make hopefully make Grant aware of that. Of you know, like we'll give Steph the the twos, the contested twos. You know, he's a great shooter. He has great layups. But you'd rather have him have a contested two than a dump off or a wide open three. So maybe kind of thinking more about those points in the paint. And how much how much zone have the Celtics been playing, or has it just been a lot of help? They don't play zone. They don't. It's just been a lot of help. Yeah, it just it depends on how much help. Like in the second half of Game One, they switched way more than they did in the first half, and it led to success. Um, mm-hmm. It also like you're okay with having Al in the switch against a small, but you're not. I mean, they were able to get by Rob somewhat easily. He was a little more hobbled in game two, and then obviously you can do whatever you want with Tice. Yeah. Interesting. It's funny. uh, The Celtics and the Patriots, no zone, man only. (laughs) Man only. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of those Boston sports. Is there zone in hockey? Do they play man? (laughs) Um, You kind of... You kind of have... I want to say you kind of have to play hockey. Yeah, you you kind of play both. There's not really one or the other. It's just, yeah. yeah. It's, it's it a lot of momentum kinda, in hockey you got to deal with. You can't really. Yeah. You just this is more like soccer. Hockey. You can play neither. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I guess it's more like that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Well, certainly with everything we're saying, I think it'll be a real physical game three. I think Boston will probably come out with a little more fire and we'll oh, see yeah. how they react to what Golden State had going in game two and then how Golden State responds to that physicality. Um, yeah. Any, any last thoughts before uh, I, I wrap it up here? 
Yeah, you know, yeah. you said, um, oh, Doug, please. No, go ahead, Garrett, go ahead. <laughs> You're too good. You first, Garrett, go. You know how um, we were talking earlier about reactionary stuff, like, oh, yeah, after the Celtics won, it's the Celtics series to lose, things like that. And, you know, we saw what three days of, you know, nonstop compliments did for this Boston Celtics team, you know, losing in dramatic fashion to the Warriors. I wonder just how they're going to respond to three days of absolute, like, bulletin board material that, you know, Ime Udoka is going to be thrown at them. Like, yes, this is just completely unacceptable. They're going to get chewed out. Like, this is just three pure days of, like, negativity. Like, you're this team? Yeah? This is what you're going to want to go down as? So I think we've, as we've seen the Celtics bounce back, like they're proven time and again this postseason that they're a resilient team. You know, yeah. I think after three days of seeing how poorly they lost this game, when by all accounts they were like playing great basketball to start it, you know, Jalen Brown was lights out for like a short few minutes before he got in foul trouble off some ticky tack crap from the refs. But like, they're going to come out, you, Peter, saying they're going to like, they're going to bounce back. They're going to be, this is going to be an absolute fire. I'm thinking they're seeing red. Like it's, I'm excited to see just how you is going to have these, this team bouncing back in game three. Yeah. I'm excited too. What I'm mostly excited for is uh, yeah, Jason Tatum. If you're listening, please be more aggressive so that Jeff Van Gundy stops saying, Oh, he needs to be more aggressive. I swear to God, every time Tatum has the ball, he's like, he needs to attack the basket and be more aggressive. So for the sole reason of giving Jeff Van Gundy one less thing to talk about, Please, Jason Tatum, be more aggressive. Just as a public service. It, <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah, I can't oh stand goodness. that, man. Je- Jeff Van Gundy. I, I have to agree with you on that. And it's actually a perfect transition to our Q&A from last week's episode. Uh, it was, who is your favorite play-by-play broadcaster and why? Uh, again, if you want to respond to these, you can listen to us on Spotify. If you click the episode and scroll down, you should see a Q&A in full for every episode we do. The link to that is in the description of this and every episode, as always. Just just click it so you don't so I don't have to keep saying it. <laughs> um, yeah. So Matt Correa said, "Let Don Orsillo commentate the damn finals." Amen. He's really really playing into Amen, to the Boston here. I mean, he's a professional. I'm sure he could do he could oh, do yeah. basketball. Oh, yeah. The ratings would be great. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the poll was did Max Struess step out of bounds? He was 75% yes. So, well, I mean, I think he go. did. Yeah. Uh, it, I would love to see what Twitter would think. Uh, Twitter <laughs> did not think he stepped out. I do I do think out of bounds. That, that little shadow, like that 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 back of the heel, just it, I think it hits. Yeah. yeah. Split second, but it hits. Yeah, I think even if it hit, it was too close for them to review and call. But we talked about that last week, so. <laughs> yeah, it, it's part of the, like... There's not enough evidence to say that he yeah. didn't. Let the call stand, but yeah, that's okay. Well, uh, unless you guys have anything else to say, I think we're uh, going to wrap it up here. So again, Game 3 of the Finals is tomorrow. That would be tomorrow, Wednesday, June 8th. It's another 9 p.m. game. Uh, and then only one day off in between, so they'll be playing Friday, June 10th. That should be at 9 p.m. as well. So hopefully we'll get another thing for another episode in the beginning of next week so we can react to games three and four see where the series stands before it goes back to the bay area so thank you all for listening and we'll catch you next time